everyone welcome to the industry show i'm your host nitin bajaj and joining us today is barbara mcafee of the full voice barbara welcome on the show thank you so much it's a pleasure to be here the pleasure is all ours hmm. so tell us who is barbara well this is an intriguing question i've been thinking a lot about it and i think at the very base i am an enthusiast i love being alive I love learning and creating and supporting other people in becoming more alive as well. Uh, many years ago, a friend of mine told me that the etymology for the word enthusiasm means to be full of the divine. Mm -hmm. And I think when we are in the middle of our gift, doing what we are meant to do, uh, then we are full of the divine. So I think, I think that's who I am at the moment. Wow, that's that is intriguing and exciting, and I want to know more. So tell us. What do you do for a living? How do you how do you help people achieve what they need to? Well, I am a master voice coach and an author and a speaker mm -hmm. and a singer songwriter, etc. Um, the root of all I do is in the voice. So, voice is clearly your passion. When you decide to make your passion into your career, right, there, there's a certain shift that happens. What was your thought process when you made that decision? It was very gradual. I was working as an organizational development consultant for 12 years. I have no education in this. I ended up doing it with a group of very creative and brave people. Mm -hmm. And I was developing my voice personally and as a, as a singer over here. And then over here, I was learning about leadership and good teamwork and what makes a good leader. And I started to see the two coalesce mm -hmm. and my colleagues started referring people to me who had problematic voices. One of my first clients, she sounded a lot like this and she was brilliant in every way, but after 30 seconds, you stopped listening to her. And so after a, a period of discernment, I realized there were a lot of people coming into organizational work that had a lot more education and background and passion for it. And it was my turn to step more fully into working with voice um, professionally. And it was scary and exciting. And it has been the best decision I ever made. One of your presentations was you said, our voice doesn't care about data privacy. Mm -hmm. Tell us something. A little more about that. When I was researching my book, Full Voice, I was astonished to discover how many ways our voice, the sound of our voices, uh, shares all kinds of information about us. Mm -hmm. So just from the sound of our voice, you can tell sometimes someone's original language for, for sure. Often their age, gender, state of health, their mood, especially if you know them. Yes. Um, uh, education level, class, all kinds of things. And so we think we're, we're being sneaky or we're being careful and mm -hmm. our voice is spilling all of this information about our background our cultural and physical background, but also about um, what, we, what we really mean to say. Mm -hmm. Often the words and the tone don't match. Yeah. Like if you've ever heard someone say, I'm sorry. You're yeah. kind of going, well, the tone is saying that you're not. And usually the tone wins out. So the, often we have unconscious habits that make our communication a little bit uh, confusing. Mm -hmm. And often we're spilling a lot of information about who we are and who we think we are by how we speak. As you go through this process and, and you know, as you've helped a lot, of the, a lot of people get to find their voice, is there a particular time and age where, where it's too late to find your voice? No, my oldest client so far was 89. Wow. And she mostly just wanted to learn a, a particular song she loved. Mm -hmm. um, she asked to have it sung at her funeral, which we did four years mm -hmm. later. How does being an immigrant or <clears throat> having a different language as your primary how does that play into this? And how do you, I, I remember reading this in your book that even though this may be your second, third or fourth language, there is a way to bring out your voice in this 
secondary language. Yes, it's been interesting. I've learned so much from working with people who have very different, every language has a song underneath it. I just work, worked with a group of folks from China last year. And that's a, t it was, they have a very tonal language mm -hmm. and then Mandarin. And so that affected the way that they, where their voice was located in their body and how mm -hmm. it, how it moved. And so the song, I, I don't think we ever lose the song of our original language, nor do I think we should. That is precious. Right. But for a lot of people, it, it, it can feel like they can't quite get all of the things that all of their meaning across mm -hmm. uh, in a powerful way inside of that song. So there's always a tension between the new language and the mm -hmm. original tone. So it has been, uh, I often use characters uh, to help people step outside of their identity a little bit so they can experiment. So I, I remember having a gentleman who was a, an immigrant from India mm -hmm. uh, pretending to be Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King right. and preaching in my studio, you know, and getting bigger and louder and using a lot more uh, inflection than he would normally use in his mother tongue. How does one even know this is something they're missing out on? Well, I just find that most people feel self-conscious about their voices. Mm -hmm. They feel, you know, for sure, if you're working in a language that isn't your mother tongue. But even beyond that, people feel like, because I'm a voice coach, I hear it all. I can't carry a tune. Mm -hmm. I never felt like I could say, I can't get my words out. Uh, I get stuck here. I don't like it, it's whiny, it's too low, it's too high, it's too weak, it's, I mean, so people feel very self-conscious, especially when we hear ourselves recorded. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, that's a universal story. I hate the way I sound on a recording. Yes. Most people feel kind of fatalistic about it, like there's nothing much to do. Mm -hmm. And I wish that this was part of every leadership program, or even in just a general, educational component because when I was a consultant every single client over 12 years we would always ask them what the top priorities were of what wasn't working well mm -hmm. communication was always at the top of the list mm -hmm. now some of that is about what we're saying but a lot of it is about not having the flexibility and choice to really think about how we're saying what we're saying in a way that makes a connection with the person or the people we're speaking with. And I just wish we would get as much training on that as we do on technical things or business management theory or team building or anything like that because all of those things fall apart if we can't get it out of our mouth in a way that people can hear us.